This is the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with your host, Vicki Davis. Welcome to episode 800 of the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast, AI in the Classroom. Today's sponsor is EverFi. April is Financial Literacy Month, and EverFi has fantastic free lessons for K 12 students. Stay tuned during the show to learn more about these valuable lessons from EverFi. As I usually do with these special milestone episodes, We've got a very special extended episode for you. But because I ran long on episode 798, this time I'm interviewing the three authors of AI in the Classroom for a deep dive into the topic everyone is talking about. But first, I want to thank my family, my husband Kip for believing in the idea behind this show and for producing so many episodes and always supporting me. And also, I want to thank my son, John, who is an incredible editor and has an amazing podcast voice himself. John, I'm so proud that you've learned to edit audio in such a way that lets us work together every day. I know it's a lot to have to listen to your mom as much as you have to, but I'm very proud of you, John. In fact, I've asked John to give us some stats on the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast and where we've come. Take it away, John. Well, Mom, since you and Dad started the 10-Minute Teacher back in February of 2017, this show has reached over 6.5 million downloads across the globe. Your top show has reached over 25,000 alone. I've edited 41 of those episodes, but Dad still holds the record at over 500. Now, let's get this show started. This is supposedly the 10-Minute Teacher, after all. And if you keep doing extended episodes like this, Dad and I are going to have to suggest you change the name. And I will never finish college because this is going to be my full-time job. Anyway, congratulations, Mom. And now, back to you. Today, we are talking with the three authors of the AI Classroom, the ultimate guide to artificial intelligence in education. As my last show on AI was a little bit extended, I can pretty much guarantee that with these amazing experts, today will be an extended episode of the 10-Minute Teacher, but it's one that you don't want to miss. So I'm going to introduce each of our guests as I pose them questions that I just, all three of you, I just really appreciate all of you coming on the show to talk about this important and very hot topic. So we are going to start with Dan. So Dan Fitzpatrick is one of the co-authors. He was recognized with the Tech Champion Award at the 2022 Digital Industry Dynamite Awards and has been featured in the EdTech 50. And he is a director at Ed Futurists and has a lot of credentials that we will list in the show notes. And you can see all the amazing things that he's done, including postgraduate diploma in design thinking in innovation from MIT, and all of us should be pretty familiar with that amazing program. So Dan, can AI be used to enhance student learning? Because there sure are a lot of schools who are immediately banning it, right? Absolutely. I think that's what excites me about this. And I think that's why the three of us got together and wrote this book, because the potential with this new technology is absolutely amazing. I think it was about three years ago that McKinsey said that over the next decade, we're going to see more technological progress than we have in the last 100 years. Now, that's quite a statement. Last 100 years, we put humans on the moon, we created computers, we created the internet, and we're going to see more progression than that in the next 10 years. I think we can start to get a glimpse of what that's going to be like when we look at artificial intelligence and especially the new types of AI, generative AI that we're starting to see, it's going to have a massive impact on teaching and learning. And teachers all over the world are reporting back right now that that it's it's absolutely supercharging learning within their classrooms. It's it's reducing teacher workload. It's helping them be more creative. It's helping teachers be more human with students as well. So yeah, it's the implications for teaching and learning are going to be absolutely vast. And I, I kind of compare this to like how the can you remember how the internet was in. in in the mid 90s when you look at it now it looks so outdated there was email basic browser who could have known that only 10 years later that steve jobs would have been introducing the iphone just how much that technology had progressed and i think we're probably in the the mid 90s version of of ai at the moment and how it's going to how it's going to ultimately benefit learning and an education as a system i guess is for anybody's guess at the moment but i know that we're going to have to 
drive this revolution with intent so that it's positive for our students and positive for our teachers and hopefully we can build a space an education system and develop it so that where our students are fit for the 21st century and can go on to be successful in this new world and we have to remind folks the big question i remember from the 90s which is when i first started teaching technology was with all this search engine stuff will kids still have to think but you know what we've discovered that they did think and they are thinking they just think in a different way and in some ways it did supercharge and now we're on the cusp of another revolution aren't we Vicky this quote from when the Gutenberg press was invented about how too much reading was going to make our kids go blind like there's literally any, any new technology has has brought fears and kind of get over it as a, as a human race like we always have and we'll find the benefits in it. So now we're going to turn to Amanda Fox. She's recipient of the 2016 ISTE Emerging Leader Award, recognized as a PBS digital innovator, served as president of the Young Educator Network for ISTE, received the President's Volunteer Award in 2018, authored many books, The Canva Classroom, The Quiver Classroom, Teaching Land, and Marker Town, and she She's Amanda Fox Stem on Twitter. And so, Amanda, can you give us some examples of some AI powered educational tools and programs and how they've been effective in helping students learn? Absolutely. One of the tools that I think I've seen educators most excited about is CuraPod. So CuraPod is like Nearpod and Pear Deck, except it has the magic of generating your lesson plans for you. And they have a wonderful lesson library that they've created as well that, you know, curated content from the other educators have created. Just like Nearpod or Pear Deck, it has the interactive elements where you can do quick formative check-ins. There's polling, Q&A, and what differentiates it is it has a word cloud. And then when you go to create a lesson, you type in your topic, you can put your learning objectives, and then you can pump in your standards. And it will generate like an amazing 15 slide presentation on that topic. And then you can go in and edit it. You can change the background images. You can change the content to suit your students in the classroom. Because one thing that we've learned from prompt engineering, which is like teacher prompt engineering with lessons, is that it doesn't stop at the output. We have to go back in and continually edit, check for accuracy, check for bias, make sure it's meeting and serving the needs of our students. The other tool that I think is fantastic is Canva. <laughs> I'm sorry, Canva Classroom author, so I have to plug Canva's text to image. Mainly, it's not as powerful or robust as Midjourney or Dolly, but it's accessible to students with the Canva for Education account. You can put it in the hands of students right now. You can use it to visualize character descriptions and literature. You, we just created a an AI Funko Pop Poet activity where students are creating like Funko Poes, like Edgar Allan Poe, and then they actually use Chat GPT to go in and author a bio on Edgar Allan Poe. Inside of our book, we have this wonderful prep and edit framework. Dan developed prep, which is all about how to prep the machine and, and prompt, prompt it to get the desired output. But I just did a session in Detroit for McCall, and the big question was like, well, what about plagiarism? And the thing is, is that if we're using it as a tool to meet the standards and we're focusing on the process instead of the product, the students are still learning by generating these outputs. My daughter, she came home with an assignment. She had to write a sonnet and it had to be A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, rhyming couplet, G, G at the end. It had to include figurative language such as euphemisms, allusions, and metaphors. And it had to have an overall theme. She didn't understand rhyme scheme. So we went to chat GPT. We put in the rhyme scheme. We put in include these figurative language elements and it spit out a poem. So we analyzed the poem. We compared it to sonnets by Shakespeare. And I asked her, does this look like a sonnet? She had to tag the ABAB. She met the standard of understanding that. Then we ran it back through and we had to analyze the figurative language components inside of the poem. And it explained it to her why this is a metaphor. She understood metaphor. And then at the end, she had to take all the things that she learned by generating poems with ChatGPT, seeing exemplars and examples in action compared to actual sonnets that exist historically and compose her own. After the fact, she had to have an image to accompany it. So we went, we actually went to Midjourney and we 
designed. We put in a prompt of exactly what fit with the poem's theme. It spit out an image. We put that image in Canva. We added the poem on top of it. We doctored it up some. And that end product, she had a lot of scaffolding along the way because literature isn't one of her fortes. But at the end of it, through that process, she hit all of those standards, all of those standards, she walked yeah. away with that understanding. So I think it's how we're leveraging the tools and how we're making sure that the learning is still there. It's still, it might be invisible, but it is happening. Well, and don't you think teachers are concerned that at the point where she had ChatGPT generate that first sonnet that she was looking at, that most kids are just going to turn that in and sign their name to it? That's exactly why teachers need to begin using it and teach students that the outputs, we can't trust the AI to give us an output that doesn't have inaccuracies, that doesn't have information that is false or those unconscious or implicit biases, either from our own input, from what we're asking, or from the data sets that the AI is trained on. I think we're going to have to get more creative with how we set assignments as well. So just asking students to hand in something that they could easily download off the internet or get ChatGPT to do. Like we have to be smarter than that as educators. We could start at that point, but then could the students come in and read the poems out? Could they could they analyze them? And we have to really get smart with this now. Because unfortunately, I think you're right, Vicky, students will just hand bits of work in that they've got an AI to do. And of course they will. I mean, if I was a student, I'd probably do exactly the same. But I think expect that as a teacher, if all you're asking students to do is work that an AI bot can do. And I think that's probably the, the one thing that gets me excited about the future of education is that actually if we're teaching our students something that an AI robot can do essentially then we're probably not preparing them in the right way for the future because when they go out to employment an employer is going to go for the AI bot every time because that's going to develop it's going to be huge so we have to focus on what are the skills that are unique to the human being here and really bring them back to the core of the education system well I always say you have to relate to educate and you know those relationships between teachers and students are more important than ever classes that are huge you're not going to be able to have that relationship and it will proliferate the use of AI tools. And, you know, we've got to get back to the core of what teaching is. I think all of your points are excellent. And we're about to get to Brad because Brad is going to talk about the ethical considerations surrounding the use of AI in the classroom. So now we're going to talk to Brad Weinstein. He's a successful author, publisher, and educator. He's the founder of Teacher Goals. He's authored multiple books, including this one. And we've had him on the show before talking about hacking school discipline. On episode 473, he talked about restorative justice and school culture. So ethics is really an area of expertise for you, Brad. So what are the ethical considerations of the use of AI in the classroom? Well, there's a lot of things to consider when working with AI and students. And when you think ethically, you think, first of all, plagiarism, is it copying? You know, when you're thinking about that, is the work yours? Is the work being produced biased or not biased? It really, when it comes down to when you're thinking about ethical considerations, you have to consider that the inputs that the machine is being fed by humans and human nature and human biases being input into systems is being learned by systems and then outputted into chat GPT and other chatbots and other AI. So as Amanda mentioned earlier, you can't just trust whatever you're getting as fact, as gospel. You always have to go through a process, which we call the edit process. And that's, that's an acronym to actually check that out. And when you're thinking about something like plagiarism, you're thinking about things like that in the classroom, and you're thinking about how that might impact education. When you take a work, like I, I, I take a work and if I can write it and I can input it into ChatGPT and I can turn it in, it doesn't mean I know it. So I have one simple test. Explain this to me in your own words, like literally have them explain to them in their own words, you know, and that, that will tell me right then and there that they know it or they don't know it. And that's always been the case, right? You know, in, in education. So you could have always copied a paper off the internet. You could have always, you know, found the research somewhere. You could have had a friend write the paper for you. It's just that now it's so much more in depth and so much more deep what we can do with this technology. So you could take something that you've already written and then content improve it. You can write this using, you know, better voice, better tone. You can feed the machine and the machine will pop out, you know, how it, how it will score on this rubric out of four. And you can go back and you can improve your paper and make sure 
sure that it includes those things that you've been missing according to the criteria. So when we're thinking about that, yes, it is plagiarism. You just copy something and turn it in as your own work, but it has to go much deeper than that. We have to think about, again, like Dan said, what we're assigning, how we're assigning it, what does mastery and success look like in the classroom? I'm just curious, you know, there's a lot more to that when it comes to the biases of the data and input and things like that. I was wondering if Dan or Amanda had anything to add, you know, when you're thinking about ethics from a classroom perspective. Well, I wanted to ask a question that maybe one of you could answer. So the lack of data transparency really concerns me. For example, we've always said you can't quote Wikipedia because we don't trust all the sources and all the humans, but we allow these AI bots to produce all of this unsighted text, no hyperlinks, no citations, and we're just quoting the AI bot. I don't understand how we allow AI to have a different standard than we allow for humans when AI is perfectly capable of generating those citations automatically. Now, I've been told ChatGPT will generate citations. I haven't seen it do it yet, but I will try it when it's no longer overloaded. <laughs> But what thoughts do you have about a data transparency and why we don't have that right now? Got to ask it, essentially. So one of the biggest types of questions is, can it do this? Can it do that? Wait a minute, it doesn't do this. And the response is always the same. Have you asked it? Because remember, I think like Amanda said, it, it's a chat bot. So you've got to go back and you have to have a back and forth dialogue with this thing and, and not just take the first thing it gives you as the finished article. So yeah, you can go back and say, what's your citations for this? Where are you getting this information from? Now, with this was more so in the in the, the last version of ChatGPT rather than the current one but sometimes it gives false citations so you got to be really careful with that but there are lots of tools being developed at the moment so google bard which is like kind of their version of chat gpt is going to come naturally with citations so everything every information it gives you it's going to have the citations at the bottom we're very much on on day one of this technology and i compare it a bit like can you remember napster yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I grew uh, up with all this stuff. <laughs> We're showing our age, aren't we, Dan? I compare it to Napster because like Napster, not many people realize, but Napster revolutionized how we consume media on the internet. Now, a lot of people remember Napster as a peer-to-peer -peer music sharing or movie sharing site that then quickly got closed down because it was, it was copyright infringement. Of course it was. It was people sharing other people's work. However, the principles of Napster or what we see now in Apple Music, we see it in Netflix, we see it in Spotify. It morphed into something new. I don't think ChatGPT is going to be the final version of this technology. We're, we're at Napster stage, okay? It could get sanctioned by governments. There are law cases going up against some of the image generators at the moment. But what's going to come out at the end is what we're going to see. And that's why I kind of say... We're in, we're in the mid-90s internet era. We're in the wild west of the internet. We're in the wild west of AI. What's going to come in the next few years will refine that. And we're so lucky because the world is getting to take part in the very early seeds of a new technology here. Not very often do we get to do that, but because it's generated such interest. But we're doing this, and we're writing this book, and we've written this book, because we believe it's not perfect yet, but educators can start benefiting from it straight away. And if we can start benefiting from it straight away, then let's get ahead of the game and let's start transforming the classroom for our students now instead of waiting for that polished version. And there are a few out there that will give you some sources right now. I can't name it off the top of my head, but there are a few that are generating some sources for people. We're taking a short break from this extended episode to talk about today's sponsor, EverFi. You know, we all remember that teacher, that study hall teacher who walked you through your first college application or the social studies teacher who taught you what taxes were and how to file them. The math teacher who used student loans to show you how interest worked. You can be that teacher. And today's sponsor, EverFi, wants to help you make a, that kind of impact with free digital lessons for K through 12 students. From budgets and banking to credit and savings, you'll find a financial literacy topic that's right for your classroom. And especially during April, Financial Literacy Month, there's no better time to equip students with smart decision making around finances. Learn how you can share these free resources with students and give them a financial foundation that lasts a lifetime. Just go to everfi.com forward slash cool cat. That's E V E R F I dot com forward slash cool cat. Now back to the show. Excellent. So one other question related to ethics. What about the fact that, you know, if you go in there and something said that you're like, okay, this is not okay. I've had that happen a few times. There's no easy way. It seems whether you're testing the 
initial version of the Bing disaster, which seems to have gotten better, and, and you get something inappropriate, it just didn't seem like there was a way to report that or to say, hey, this shows bias. You know, how do you, with a chat bot, report bias or flag something so that somebody can look at it? I use ChatGPT a lot, as you can probably tell. So there are ways to kind of to feed back on the on the prompt on the the responses that you get there. And I think I think on all on all the platforms that I've played with anyway, you can report you can report kind of if something is coming back and it's it's inappropriate. But I, I think some of these tools would also say that maybe it's the maybe it's the job of kind of the tools that come between them and the user's job to do that so for example i know of an ed tech company in the uk who, who have built a platform using chat gpt where they they filter out certain information before it goes to chat gpt and then they filter out certain information when it comes back from gpt and it's kind of solving a lot of issues around data protection and and potentials for any kind of misuse there as well so i think there's a big role for kind of those those third-party companies who are going to build applications around this yeah i think we we'll solve it i think it's it's a major problem at the moment and i think the concerns that you've got and that teachers have got are the same concerns i work with businesses i train businesses and marketing teams with ai as, as well as teachers and they've got exactly the same concerns and because obviously they don't want to put content out that could potentially be biased but there are companies out there who are working on this right now and i think we we will get there but i think it's really important to say like like brad and amanda have emphasized as well that the human is still essential in this process the human still has to edit it still has to read it i suppose just like a teacher picking up a textbook they will read through it they're not just going to give it straight to the student they're going to see if it's appropriate if it's relevant for their students and in the same way you have to do that with the generated content with that comes from ai you're thinking about all this you know as dan was saying just you can't just trust it what it puts as gospel as, as like i was saying before and you can get in trouble with the internet like our kids can search inappropriate things on the internet and get themselves in trouble they can pick up a phone and do something they should do with their phone when they call a peer there's going to be things that are not perfect with the system for a while right so it's going to be a, a new way of monitoring things a new way of looking at discipline a new way of you know our school policies and procedures and handbook i mean it's a whole new world but it's nothing it's nothing new the kids with technology are maybe you know looking at things or getting inappropriate responses or you know searching pictures they shouldn't online and all those other things and, and again as as we were saying, like you look at the algorithmic bias and what, what is inputted into the machine, it can further perpetuate inequalities and biases and things like that. So we always have to be careful of that because there might not be as much information inputted from certain groups of people, ethnicities, cultures, and things like that. So who, who's writing this content that's getting fed to the machine? So when you're thinking about that, it's always important. And also, when you get something that's outputted, you have to prove it. Like, you can't just, like, take a sentence like this. What's the definition of social-emotional learning? Like, you have to actually go and verify, you know, that that's actually legit somewhere. You have to find a source and attribute it to that and make sure that it still makes sense. So that's why we're really big on the prep and edit process in our book. It's not just using chat. GPT. It's using it with fidelity to enhance learning and what we already do. I'm teaching Python in my CS class. When I had them go in and, and ask ChatGPT to write in Python tic-tac-toe game, all 10 students got 10 different tic-tac-toe games only eight of them would run. And we had to tell them what platform and how we're running, but eight of them would run. And so they were all different. So it was unique, but that just shows that you know, you sometimes you get unique that works and sometimes you don't. So let's shift for a second. And Amanda, let's talk about the impact AI will have on the role of teachers in the classroom and how teachers can adapt. First and foremost, when we have classrooms of 30 students and the accountability of teachers or it keeps rising over the years. So, you know, we're responsible for addressing student learning gaps at grade level, holding students behind. When, when you have AI platforms, and I just demoed this in Detroit, that help with pedagogical frameworks like UDL and DOK, you can take your standards and you can plug it in and ask what complexity do students need to understand a standard at. It'll tell you. And then you can design a lesson for that, like again with Curapod. <laughs> and the beautiful thing is, is it will spit out a lesson in under a minute. And if you have 10 kids that need that multi-tiered instruction, that have IEPs, that have different components to help them learn at grade level, you can generate 10 different lessons on the same topic. You can alter the grade level. You can alter the tone. 
the reading level and, and use it really to struggling learners and address all the different types of learners in your classroom. I know when I was teaching last year, I had a student who was a voluntary mute, would not speak in class. And presentations weren't something that were in his wheelhouse. But if I would have had like DID, it's a video generation platform where students can put in a script and have an AI avatar speak for them. I'm pretty certain that would have empowered him to be able to present his information and give him a voice. When we're looking at how it's going to help teachers, it's going to help us become more efficient. It's going to help us address the needs of our students and get some of our time back that that we've lost with just the insurmountable tasks that are put on us. You can hear some administrators saying, Amanda, I want to make sure that these teachers are actually doing the lesson plans that they've written automatically. And you said it, it's what, Curio pod? How do you spell it? Curipod. It's C-U-R-I-P-O-D. So for example, I generated a lesson on figurative language. You don't have to generate whole lessons. You can do lesson hooks. You can do exit tickets, check-ins. There's even an SEL component to where you can check in where they are in terms of mental health and emotional well-being. This isn't just spitting out text. It's a lesson. It's actually spitting out content. So the figurative language lesson that was created actually went through and laid out slides for what a metaphor is, what a simile is. And like Nearpod, you have a pen code. Students join in. They participate. And you're able to see in real time their understanding of, of the content and their understanding of the, the topic through polls, word clouds, Q&As, open-ended discussions. And there's a bunch of strategies that they have with Think, Pair, Share, having them team up. Even using these text-generative AI platforms to create project-based learning and genius hour activities for students and even leveraging it in their own research and their own direction. Creating chatbots that solve problems in local communities would be a great one. Thinking of Shark Tank and my STEM background. The future where I see it going, there's another platform called Professor Jim, P-R-O-F-J-I-N. It, it kind of does the same thing as Curipod, but it has an AI avatar. You can have Socrates or Archimedes come in and actually talk and teach these principles. Three interactive 3D models where they can click on a heart they can turn it and they can see all, all the pieces. So I think what it's going to do is it's going to give teachers access to tools to create content faster and more efficiently, especially new teachers that are, are coming in for the first time. And not all the content's perfect. Just like ChatGPT and students were worried about them, you know, generating something and running with it. Administrators, you know, we, we need to talk to teachers about using these tools but going back in, editing it, and make sure that it's meeting the needs of the students in the classroom, that it's hitting the standards, and that the the students are are learning with it. Yeah. And Amanda, I think adding to that is that the generation of the lessons is step one, but the differentiation of instruction, the ability to use you know UDL in what we do and reach all learners, I think that's the game changer. You know, we. We, we all have made lessons before, but differentiation, writing different lesson plans, having tools that can be accessible for our learners is also huge. In addition to that, students can now get input almost instantly on some of the stuff that they're working on because how long does it take a teacher to grade an essay? You know, how long does it take a teacher to give them feedback in class when there's 35 other kids in that room? So when you're looking at getting some feedback on what you're doing and asking ChatGPT or another chatbot, you know, to look at this and how would you write this? And even parents at home, I mean, do all parents know how to help their kids, you know, write an essay or write a persuasive essay or do these certain types of math problems? So I'm looking at this and Dan, you were talking about this on our Slack group, you know, when we were thinking about the parent input and, you know, acting as almost a tutor sometimes and maybe able to help kids do things that they couldn't do before. That's why one of the reasons I'm excited is not just the teacher usage, it's also how we can reach all learners and how the students themselves can use the technology to get the feedback they need. Because I've got I've got an essay that was like three months or a month old from a teacher before, right? Like, what what use is it now that I turn in my paper and a month later now finally got a grade on it? And the teachers, you know, give them some credit. Maybe it even takes twenty minutes to grade an essay times one hundred and seventy five students at the high school level. It's going to take weeks if they, you know, want to sleep or eat. But if a student could just run it through and say, "This is my rubric, and what are your, you know, how can I improve my writing?" and it gives them feedback, they can do that first pass of, of feedback from ChatGPT or whatever tool they're using. So how, Brad, does AI impact our, you know, being human, our humanity? 
Well, I, I look at it in a couple of ways. I look at, you know, there was just an article that came out the other day about how people that were just really good at technology are kind of not the best in the office, the most well-liked, kind of had were pompous, are kind of out of place now because the technology is doing some of the things that maybe they were doing or, you know, maybe they were in charge of. So when it comes to the future, I look at, you know, when I'm thinking about emotional intelligence as the key. Emotional intelligence, you know, has been proven to be probably the most important thing in in workplace success and, uh, you know, furthering your career and all of those other big factors. So when you think about emotional intelligence, it doesn't matter what technology you have, you're going to always have a need for, you know, self-management, self, self self-awareness. You're always going to need, you know, to have empathy for others. You're always going to be working with other people and in teams and collaborating. So I think the differentiator will be that emotional intelligence, but it's also applying that emotional intelligence and that humanity to artificial intelligence as well, because how would you know if the tone of the output is going to come across to your audience in this tone of voice, or, you know, it's going to be empathetic, or it's going to be, you know, something that the humans receiving your messages and your communications are going to resonate with. So you can't lose who we are as humans. The machine tries to mimic, you know, emotions and tries to mimic tone of voice. But the reality is, is that we can't lose who we are in this. We still have to have human intuition. We still have to have, you know, our judgment. We still have to apply what ChatGPT put to our beliefs, morals, and values as humans. So when I'm thinking about, you know, the future and what skills we're going to need, it's what we've always needed. Now we can spend even more time with our students because I'm spending less time doing some of the other tasks that are more monotonous. Now I'm able to spend more time talking to my students, going around, building relationships and working with my kids and uh, spending time with my own family. Shoot, if this makes my job even quicker, I have more time at home. I'm more energized when I head back into school that next day and I got to spend some quality time with my family. We're talking about humanity. There's two more pieces we need to kind of cover. One is a lot of students and adults are starting to ask mental health type questions of these AI bots. So What are the challenges with this phenomenon that's going on? And, you know, for example, one of my concerns is the AI bot doesn't have the same reporting requirement you or I have if a student came and talked to us. So what needs to be done with the student mental health needs as they converse with AI chatbot? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I did a bit of kind of research into this back in January. So back on the older version of ChatGPT and kind of just almost just pretended to be a student and kind of interacted with it and, and kind of recorded what what it was coming out with and i think i did a twitter thread on it at the time it's really interesting and it's very controversial i think if students are using it which they will do to ask it questions personally i think when i tested it it came out with some great answers for students and it always kind of ended the response by saying speak to somebody about it now, I think the one of the running themes that we've talked about here is that you can't always trust this and we shouldn't. But if a student on their own is accessing it, I think it's probably it goes back to kind of why banning the technology is so counterproductive because a student can go home and use it. We can't stop them using it in their own time. So I think what we need to do as educators and as schools, to educate really, is tell them about this technology, tell them that it's probably not the best place to do this at the moment, and to keep drilling that message with our students that if, they, if they're in help, if they need, they need to talk to somebody, there might be a school counsellor or, or, or somebody in the, in the school who can help. I do think, though, that this side of the technology will develop and, the, and I know that there are some companies at the moment who are we're doing a lot of research and investment into this of how tools like this can help the elderly who are lonely and can help yeah, just generally people who are lonely and can be kind of a bit of a first stop for kind of somebody who needs to talk to someone who about their well-being and about their mental health. I think what excites me about this, I think, is that someone's mentioned this already. You can actually train this technology on your own data. So you don't just have to talk to ChatGPT and get answers from from ChatGPT. You can train GPT on your own set of data. So let's say, for example, you're a school and you've got your policies around well-being, mental health, who to talk to when you need to talk to them. You could have an in-house bot that uses the GPT technology and you could promote that to students and say, so if you do need to talk to somebody and the, the bot would be trained to direct the student 
in the direction you need them to go in. I think it's like anything, isn't it? If our students are using something that we don't think is going to be 100% safe for them, then we need to do two things. We need to offer them an alternative and we need to educate them. We do. And so that really leads us to our final conversation, which is leadership. Dan, what kind of leadership do we need from administrators, from those in education as it relates? Because when you have upheaval like this without leadership, things just happen on their own and that new policies, new thoughts, new uses, new pedagogies all need to emerge. Yeah, 100%. And I think we've got a lot of lessons to learn from how we've kind of dealt with social media over the last 10 years. I think what we did was, as a society in general, kind of went up, oh, here's social media, let's let's use it, but then didn't kind of learn any lessons or, or safeguard. And, and I'm talking about from a government level all the way down to a parental level, really, in certain circumstances. And I'm being very broad there. But I think, especially from a government level, I think, the, as you can tell by my accent, I'm over in the UK and our government have literally just put together a policy on social media. Talk about trying to bolt the stable after the, the horses escaped. I think we've got to learn those lessons and I think we've got it, it comes down to intent. We can't just, I think we can't bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening because we're just going to cause a larger digital divide for our students, which is going to cause more problems for them down the line. And we can't just pretend we'll just let it happen. Because I think that's the other side of this. And I think we've got to use it with intent. So we're going to need leaders who have got vision. We can't have the types of leaders that just let things tick on as they always have been. They're not going to be able to lead our educational institutions into this new era. We're going to need le leaders who are brave, who can collaborate, who are inclusive, who are adaptable, who are ethical. And that's going to, and we've talked about ethics so much in this in this podcast. We need them to have a grounding of what ethics is, and also our learners themselves, because uh, again, as we've talked, this technology is going to transform so fast, and we need to be agile. We need leaders who are agile, who can who can take their teachers, their students, their institutions with them on a journey that's going to be quite fast it's going to be quite bumpy but it's going to be quite exciting as well for for learning so i think we need to start innovating i mean you mentioned at the start that i did the design thinking and innovation course at mit and one of the things that course taught me was that we as institutions and as as educators we need to spend some time in that innovation space and looking at what's coming and developing strategies otherwise we're going to we're going to be kind of bunkered down in the school building and all this innovation is going to be is going to be banging on the door and, and we can't just ignore it because it's going to make our schools irrelevant after a while. We're going to have to move with the times. And it all comes down, I think, to, and, and this is where my, Amanda and Brad's heart are at with this book. It's how do we give our students an experience, skills and knowledge that's going to prepare them to be successful in the world. And it all comes down to that. And good leadership should make that happen, especially in turbulent times. Excellent. The AI Classroom, the ultimate guide to artificial intelligence in education is the book. This is a quadruple episode of the 10 Minute Teacher, probably the longest, it will be the longest longest one I've ever released, but I think it's also one of the most important. Thank you all three of you for helping us talk all around the topic of AI. It's worth having extended conversations. And I just want to encourage everyone listening that we need to be part of the conversation. Really, in many ways, we're all newbies at this. I know a lot of people think the term newbie is a negative, but we're all there together. You can either join in and, and learn with all of these experts who are learning too, or you can just wait a couple of years and let it pass you by. It's very exciting to be part of change. My students have been helping me form my own opinions about AI because AI is changing so rapidly, but we haven't talked about it. I use the AI inside my notebook app Notion, and it's fantastic. Maybe, I don't know if it's pushed forward by ChatGPT or what's the API, but it's pretty impressive. So again, the book is The AI Classroom. And thank you, Dan, Amanda, Brad, all of you for coming on the show. Thank you to today's sponsor, EverFi. We've talked about how everyone remembers that teacher and EverFi's lessons help you become that meaningful teacher who really helps students understand real world skills. From budgets and banking to credit and savings, you will find a financial literacy topic that's right for your classroom. Especially now during April, Financial Literacy Month, there's no better time to equip students with smart decision making around finances. So go to everfi.com forward slash coolcat. That's E V E R F I dot com forward slash coolcat. 
You've been listening to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast. If you like this program, you can find more at CoolCatTeacher.com. If you wish to see more content by Vicky Davis, you can find her on Facebook and Twitter under CoolCatTeacher. Thank you for listening.